things. Um, so I guess I might as well announce it now, so I don't, I don't interrupt things. But what has happened recently with this series on dating? As you know, we've talked about dating, but we've got to the place where David has now actually got to the front. And uh, he's been received by not just the people of Judah, but also the entire uh, nation of Israel, which is a prophetic picture of the Messiah in his, in his second coming. Because even though we understand there is always a remnant according to the election of grace, there is a Judah, so to speak, that has received Yeshua. But the prophetic picture is that there will be a time when so shall all Israel be saved. Amen? Now, with that, I ran into this uh, intersection in the spirit because I'm like, okay, well, now there's only two other things that, that we're going to talk about. Uh, you know, the building of the tabernacle and the Solomon and whatever, and the whole Bathsheba thing. I'm like, is that what you want me to end on? Is that how we're going out like this, God? <laughs> and uh, the Lord began to speak to me about a few things about what I'm supposed to do next. Okay? So what is going to happen is... God has told me that in the Bible study fashion that the next thing that I am supposed to start teaching on is the book of Acts. And I mean Acts chapter 1, verse 1, and literally walk through it. He's made it very clear. We are supposed to mimic we're supposed to show, like we're talking about these quote unquote Bible believing Christians that just aren't believing what the Bible actually says. We're, we're, we're frustrated in some areas because, well, why well, read the book of Acts and God did this and God did that? And I'm like, well, because there's certain, there's a template in the book of Acts that's not operating in the congregation's period. And I'm really impressed by the Spirit of the Lord to say, I challenge us to really understand what a first century move was really about and to start craving that like ever before. It, has anyone ever read the book of Acts and been frustrated like, well, why didn't God do this? Why well, come I don't see this happening? Why come I don't learn? Right? But if you look around at all the churches, all the synagogues, you see them all living according to the book of Acts. So is it really fair to be frustrated or complain about not getting the results when those certain ingredients are not there? So I'm expecting to learn more than I've ever learned myself. I'm expecting to be challenged, I'm expecting to be corrected, but I also want the Spirit of God to start bringing greater revelations of what He wants to do with us right now. I do believe it's also a prophetic season of transition. I do believe God gave a prophetic word about switch, where things are just switching, things are just switching. And I believe God's priority of seeing his son glorified, of seeing his spirit move, and to see his word being magnified is really on the forefront of, of the agenda. It's like there's been so many distractions in the past few years. There's so many deviations and tangents, and now God is like, get back to Acts. And the series is literally going to be called, even though it will be quote unquote pretty step by step, Love in Action. A-C-T-S-I-O-N-S, love in action. So certain things like this. Um, how many times is, you know, because we're all supposed to be at love and grace, whatever. I mean, did you see, did you, did you, when you read the book of Acts, do you see the love of God? Do you see how God is moving? No? What's that? What okay, right? How many times is the word love in the book of Acts? Zero. Zero. Love in action. And that's the problem. We're talking about love. We're condemning those people who, well, you're not being loving with it because you don't have the right definition of love. There's no doubt that God's love, God's power, God's faith, God's word was moving the book of Acts. But he didn't have to say love, 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 and grace, grace, grace. That, that wasn't necessary. Because when you love God, you just do what you're supposed to do. Amen? So tonight's message is kind of the transition into that. But I want to, to, to you know, come out of this, this, this David thing right, but at the same time, uh, bring a nice bridge beginning uh, next week. So, when we're concluding uh, the series, the, the three-week series, and talking about the demonism and the witchcraft and all this stuff, 
it was interesting that the last thing that happened to Saul before he died was that he was visiting a medium. So it says, Saul died for his transgressions because he did not keep the word of Yahweh and for asking counsel of one that had a familiar spirit. So tonight we're not going into the devil and all this other stuff, but it's interesting. I want to get back to if he had kept the word of Yahweh, the demonism, the witchcraft wouldn't have been an issue in the first place. All root of sin, all root of rebellion, deception, and pride still comes back to what is your relationship with God's word? Not just what is your relationship with God, what is your relationship with God's word? I still, to this day, the most convic one of the most convicting things that the pastor, that my youth pastor, the Levy Lord, challenged me with when I was talking to this girl and talking to that girl and talking to the girl, he said one question. Does she have a relationship, not with Jesus, not with God, does she have a relationship with the book? The root of all ground spiritually still comes down to the word. So, note 1A. Yeshua commanded the first, Yeshua answered the first of all the commandments is Shema Yisrael Yahweh Eloheinu Yahweh Echad, right? And we, what we broke down last week was when you ask people generally, what's the greatest commandment? Oh, you got to love God. But that did not, that was not a literal translation. Literally, the first word is, listen, O Israel, hear, O Israel, Yahweh your God is one, or he is united. And we talked about the significance of the supremacy of Yahweh and the exclusivity. That is literally what covenantal calling and confirmation is about. The, the unity of God, Yahweh is one, but that's also when he's united. There's an or you worship him and no other. Only. Yahweh is the only God. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. So, in that spirit of Deuteronomy chapter 6, going deeper into what it means to love God. And this goes back to my Acts point again. We can talk about, oh, I love God, I love God. Okay. Do you teach your children diligently and talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk, when you lay down, when you rise? How prevalent and consistent is the word of God in your life? Because if it's not, then you cannot brag about how much you love God. Hear a Israel, Yahweh God is one. You shall love him with all your heart. Yeah, I love Jesus, whatever. Are you talking about him when you rise? Talk when it comes to his command, when it comes to his word. Now we got a different stratosphere of relationship with God. A relationship is not just about the peripheral or the outside. It's the intimate working of the communication with someone's person. Psalms 119, verse 97. Oh, I love your law or your Torah. It is my meditation. That's one of the English words used. And if you've noticed, I put slash conversation all day. If you go to, uh, you know, modern Israel, the word called sicha, which is a you know, conversation or whatever. So it's not just a meditation, oh, mm, I'm sitting thinking about whatever, doing my little positions and all this. No, it's actually also something that you're conversing with, a communication, a conversation, a meditation. So when you look at it from, from this perspective, note one day, we love Yahweh by contemplating and communicating his word to ourselves and others. That is what's not happening. There still is this disconnect between the fellowship, the relationship, and the communication of God and his word of God and his people. Note 2a, he says, and these words I command you shall be in your heart. Because remember, as Jesus said, out of abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. When there's still a, a disconnect between the word of God and you don't feel like you want to communicate or need to communicate or it's not necessary, what is it really in your heart? Because what's in your heart is going to come out. These words I command you shall be in your heart. Now look at Psalm 119 again, verse 11. I have hid your word in my heart so that I will not sin against you. I have hid your word in my heart. 
so that I will not sin against you. We hide God's word in our heart by memorizing it. If a man tells me he's married, he's been married for 15 years, the same woman, and he loves her, I'm like, oh, great, what's her name? Oh, uh, uh, uh. <laughs> what? What is she like? Oh, uh, uh, uh. There are certain things when you love someone, you just memorize, you know it by heart. So, from this point on, this will probably be one of the easiest one seat two sermons you've ever heard. Because the majority of every single verse will be from Psalms 119. You want to know what it's like to have to really be in love with God. You want to know what it's really like to be in love with God's word. And this is why we're ending the series on David. David wrote Psalm 119. And what, why he became convicted is because I realized this is not the standard when it comes to loving God's word. When you look around and you look at how David, why was David, even though his mistakes and stuff like, why was David still had the favor of the Because God loves his word and he loves those who love his word. And Psalm 119 was just tearing me up this week and challenging people to really, really, really search your heart when it comes to God's word. He says in verse 18 and 19, open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of your Torah. Before I open my Bible, well, this is, I'm just, I actually think it got a little weird, okay? Uh, I, I thought I couldn't get any stranger thing. I literally, okay, so anytime you see Psalm 119, verse 18, you need to automatically go to Luke 24, where Jesus says, then he opened their understanding that he might know the scriptures. The first thing there needs to be a humility to understand. This is actually a spiritual text, and I can't understand this without God actually giving me his revelation. And I pray, give me your version of the story. Give me your interpretation of facts. I don't care how long you've been in the game. You've got nothing on the Holy Spirit. I don't care. Listen, I listen to everybody, rabbis, whatever, but it doesn't matter. No one has the greater revelation than Yeshua who's given us the Holy Spirit. So before I do, literally, this is what I pray. After I pick up both my Bibles and put it to my head, and I say, open my eyes that I may see you first. Then I say, open my eyes that I may behold one to see from your Torah. Then I say, open my understanding that I may know your scriptures. The positioning of humility saying, I'm not gonna be arrogant enough to think that I can actually learn this without you actually giving me your version of the story and your interpretation of that. Then he says, do not hide your commandments from me. It's not simply about under, uh, understanding that you need your eyes to be open, you need to remove the veils, whatever, but well, that means there are certain people that God just chooses, to, he's just not going to reveal it to them. And who are those people? People that will take his revelation for granted. Don't hide your commandments from it. I want to know what you're actually showing, what you actually need to be saved. He says here in Psalms 119, verse 24, your testimonies are my delight and my counselors. The other problem that we have is we're getting all this counsel and advice from things that are not from the word of God. If I hear another quote unquote Christian believer, whatever you want to call yourself, and I'm like, okay, well, what did you do about, well, you know, my therapist said, whatever. I'm like, okay, that's, that's not biblical, but okay. Are you, all the trouble, all the drama, all the things that we're going through, the unnecessary stuff only comes down to one thing. You're getting the wrong counsel. But he says, before he says there's counsel, he actually delights in his testimony. You know why people don't want you to get out of counsel? Because sometimes it's not what they want to hear. It's not going to be too delightful as God's suggestions, his diagnosis, his prescriptions. But you have to position yourself and say, I don't care what it is. If it's the truth, if it's right, I'm delighting in this. I want you to be my counselor. Yahweh's word shows you, right? Open my eyes. That I may be one to open my eyes. Yahweh's word shows you the right advice. 
Too many people are in unnecessary problem and drama because they did not get the right counsel. Why did they not get the right counsel? Because the counsel they got was not biblically based. It's, a simple, it's very simple. But this is still happening. Another reason why God says, get to the book of Acts. Just, just go to the book of Acts. But watch. For you to want the right counsel, verse 29, remove the way of lying from me. How many liars are still in your life? How many people do you still listen to that just don't tell the truth, but you're still letting them? Huh? How many doctors? How many things? What, what lie? There is an attitude where you say, get that out of my life. Remove the way of lying. Psalm, Psalm, Psalm 119, I'm fun. You can also, for those who don't know or haven't been introduced to Psalm 119, it's the longest psalm. It's like 179 or like, it was like, God was not playing with Psalm 119. Remove the way of lying from me. I have chosen the way of truth. Some people still are choosing to be lied to. And then blaming God when things get, you know, crazy, whatever, or things don't work out, whatever. I have chosen the way of truth. I've laid your judgments before me. That's a choice. Verse 36. Incline my heart to your testimony, not to covetousness. Turn my eyes away from beholding vanity. Lying, vanity. Lying, vanity. All lies are vain. They're just... Futile, fruitless, leads to no, nowhere. Uh oh, okay. Abandoning lies for God's word is a choice. It, it actually is that simple. Abandoning, well, you have a choice. Am I going to listen to God's word or am I going to keep listening to, the, to, to these lies? <clears throat> Psalm 119, verse 46. I will speak of your testimony before kings and not be ashamed. It's very, very fascinating to me. Another reason why there's lacking of power, because when people of faith get in front of people who don't have faith, or get people of these, they have these, they're, they're gatekeepers or they have these high positions, then all of a sudden God's word seems to disappear. All of a sudden we can't find God's word. We don't know what to say. The power is in the faith in God's word. Not in the faith in someone else's response or someone's reaction. So whether it's a king, whether it's a poor, doesn't matter. You should be consistent and faithful with God's word. Whatever you say to a king is whatever you say to, the, to, to, to a servant. I will speak your testament before kings and not be ashamed. There still is an issue of people actually being ashamed of God's word. Being ashamed of what God said and how he said it. <clears throat> Verse 98 through uh, 100, uh, technically this would be verse 98 through 99. Here's something that I had to literally take personal, because again, I don't have the, the, the theological background or the PhDs and all sorts of stuff. But I remember the first time when I was going through my um, ordination and stuff like that, and, and it wasn't, by the way, like, yeah, I got online, got my certificate the next day, I'm your bachelor. Uh, it was two years of just the, the accountability thing. Like, they, they didn't even ordain you. Like, well, here's a line, you need to marry people, whatever. You will have records, you need to have six pastoral references, you need to have this theological exam. It was like, wow. But my first test, they asked me, wow, what, 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 what Bible school did you go to? What, what college did you go to? Didn't go to college. Well, how did you? Because I prophesied Psalm 98. I took it seriously. Your commandments have made me wiser than my enemies. I have more understanding than all my teachers. Not because of Jason Ford, because I took God's word seriously. And God has put me in positions with people that I should not be talking to, that I should not be giving advice or counsel. Why? It's because of the wisdom of God's word. Yahweh's word turns students into teachers, servants into kings, and the wisdom of your enemies to foolishness. And what you'll see when you really get into the book of Acts, it was just 
uncompromising Jews when it came to the word of God. That's really all it came down to. But hold on. Dave, David says something that's kind of hard for us to hear. It's good for me that I've been afflicted. It's good for me. Why? So I'll learn your statutes. It's good for me that I've been afflicted. Verse 49 and 50. He says, remember the word upon which you have made me hope. This is my comfort in my affliction. For your word gives me life. That is true a thousand times, infinity times infinity times a thousand. The only true comfort is the reality of God's word in every aspect of affliction. Remember the word upon which you've made me hope. When you can take God's word back to him and says, the reason why I'm still here is because you told me to believe in this. Regardless of how hard it is, regardless of how torn it is, you told me to believe in this. Remember the word upon which you made me hope. So when you go through Deuteronomy chapter uh, 8, when he's talking about these things about, he's like, yeah, um, I let you hunger. I let you starve. I let you go through these things so that you know man does not live by bread alone, but by everything that comes out of the mouth of God. It's good for someone to be afflicted, that you may learn how to really trust in God's word. Those that love your law have great shalom. Proud shalom. Great peace. Nothing shall offend them. Wait a minute. Love your law. Peace. Offense Affliction, torment, lack of peace. When I talk to people, whether it's challenging, whether it's anxiety, fear, torment, there's always a disconnect with God's word and loving God's word. But there's a promise for loving God's word. Great peace and deliver from the offense. God's word confronts the contradictions between peace and affliction. When you're dealing with torment, when you're dealing with affliction, anxiety, things of that nature, Where's God's word in the middle of that? <clears throat> Here's something else he said in uh, verse 60. I hurried up and did not delay to keep your commandment. That's the other problem in the kingdom of God. Well, I know God said this, whatever, blah, blah, blah. Two years later, I know God told me to do this. Three years later, I know God told me to do this. That was not David's attitude. You want to be a king? That's what a king does. He's quick to hear and obey God's word. I did not delay to keep your commandments. When God told me to do something, I did it. There's many people who are not blessed. There's people that actually you were supposed to bless, and they're still waiting for blessing. And they're mad at God because they're not understanding why God has blessed them. God, and but God says, I put it in uh, Steve's hand, and Steve apparently is just not doing what he's supposed to do. So, yeah. There are certain things that we're supposed to do that God, God uses us through the body. And sometimes God says, well, yeah, unfortunately, I'm going to allow this person to kind of go through it long because he's long and suffering. Yeah, children of Israel, you're going to do it. It's going to be long and suffering because knucklehead over here still want to, but I'm making a point. Let us not delay to do what God told us to do. Always practice swift obedience to perform God's word. Procrastination is sin. Sorry. Procrastination just means disobedience. Well, I'm just not doing it yet, but I'll get to it. That's, that's a no. That means you're not doing what you're supposed to do. So in these last few slides, do not leave me to my oppressors. It is time for you, Yahweh, to act. And this is why God wants you to 
keep his word. Because at the end of the day, love and action. What we're all expecting, hoping, desiring, and wanting is for God to move. But whatever your circumstances, whatever your situation is, at the end of the day, God, we just want you to move. Show up in this area. But the tension and the frustration when God says, but you didn't do that. My, my word is what does the actions, remember? The Holy Spirit was hovering, waiting for what? The word. Then God said. Don't leave me in my pressures. It is time for you to act. Why? They have made your law void. Now this is very interesting to me. There's a, there's a, there's this concern that David has when people are taking God's word and acting like it's not that important. It's not necessary. Remember the whole story of Josiah. Over 40 kings. Even if there are good kings, half of them were still compromising. Well, you know, it was a good king, but they still had a high place. You got like two and a half kings. I said two and a half because one kind of started off with no high places and he kind of fell off or whatever. But at the end of the day, the last great king, out of 40 kings, only three, that got rid of, high, high, got rid of the high places, was Josiah. But what was the encounter? It started off said Josiah was a good king. What changed and brought the greatest revival Israel had seen up until that point? It's because they went to repair the house of the Lord and someone found the word of God. The whole story is, yeah, he was doing it, good things. He was doing right things, but he was doing it without the book. He was doing it without the word of God. Do not do things for God without God. Stop doing things for God without God. Everything changed. Josiah would have been fine. He still would have been a good king, whatever. People would have been blessed, whatever. But the revival that brought supernatural transition to Israel was not because he was a good king. It's because they repented at the words of the book. So then David says, rivers of water run down my eyes because they don't keep your law. So here's the point. In conclusion. Transitioning from this king, understanding how he got so far, why he got so far, understanding his attitude towards God's word, and transitioning into the book of Acts. God wanted me to leave you with this question. Do you have a word world view. David is affected by people that are blowing off the word of God and not keeping. What in the word are you crying about? Are you more upset about when your cable goes off? Are you more upset about when you're... What in the word are you... What actually from God's word is convicting your spirit? If you still aren't bothered that people are splitting hell wide open, there's a problem. If you still aren't bothered by the oppression and the perversion and the, the doubts and the, all the stuff that is raping our society, there's a problem. If you're more upset about other little minor things that have no eternal value, what in the word are you actually upset about? So with the series in the book of Acts, may God bring us back to a greater compassion and heart for the thing that he actually cares about. And I hate that I have to put this disclaimer on. Listen, he cares about everything. God is, a, a, he understands your relationship situation. He understands your financial So I've never said that those things don't matter. But there's a problem when those things become greater than, more important and more focused on in the word of God. Amen? Stand up on your feet. Now, in conclusion, we understand who is the ultimate Word of God. Jesus is the Word of God. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, the same as in the beginning of God. 
But then it says, all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made. Is there anything in your world that has been created without the word of God? Is there anything in your world that you've allowed that has nothing, no origin in the word of God? When it comes to your, your heart, when it comes to your thoughts, when it comes to why you do what you do. So we're taking all word and all spirit. To another realm of existence at 1C22. For the purpose of not just an axe anointing. I still believe when Jesus says he that believes on me, he'll do greater works. I don't believe that we're supposed to, Acts is supposed to be the stopping point. Acts was simply telling us, no, this stuff is possible. But don't limit yourself to look back. But there will be a cost, and that cost is ultimate abandonment to the Word of God. If I preach and no one gets saved, I still believe people can get saved. If I preach and no one gets healed, I still believe people can get healed. If I preach and no one gets healed, I still believe that healing, deliverance, and salvation still happens in Jesus' name. But why not preach, have agreement, and actually see people get saved, healed, and delivered, like they were in the book of Acts? Amen? So, Father, in Jesus' name, I'm well aware that most of us know your son. But, Lord God, we can't love a God we don't know. And if there's anyone here tonight that says, I don't know Jesus for himself. I didn't know that he died for my sin. I didn't know that he rose again for me. I did not know that he loved me. I didn't know that he gave me eternal life. If there's anyone here in this place tonight and they don't know you for themselves, I ask God to speak to them now about their need. I pray for supernatural impartation to them for their need to be forgiven and their need to understand why you died for them. <clears throat> Capture every heart in this place tonight. And Holy Spirit, as we go through this next transition, fill us with greater love for your word, but unite all word and all spirit. Make it alive. Quicken it to our hearts and our souls. That we will not be known for anything other than the Word of God and the Spirit of God as you see it fit. In Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. So we're pressing in um, in, a, in, a, in a deeper, uh, in, a, in a different way. I, I, I feel like that this is, I just feel like I'm surrounded by people that still aren't giving up, even though the circumstances say they should even though there's certain uh, challenges and obstacles. But, I'm, but faith has not left me. I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm just convinced that, that we are around the corner from something tremendous. I've never had, by the way. Um, so here's what happens. People come up to me like, oh, trust me, I know it's kind of maybe seem discouraged right now, but people... But people are going to be coming, and your your ministry is going to be like whatever. And like, it's never been really about this numbers thing, or am I qualified? Or that, that that's never been an issue. But people are like, oh, I had a vision of you going here, and I had a vision of a dream, and you were, this place was packed, whatever, blah blah blah. That's the, like, okay, yeah, praise God when it happens, if it happens, praise God, whatever. Until this week, when I for the first time I had a dream, the very first time. I've never said, oh, God, I pray that you fill this place. Oh, please give me more people. That's never the right And God gave me for the first time a dream where the building was packed front and row. Mike and I were still in the front as usual. <laughs> <laughs> I got ADD. And God started challenging me not to believe for a bigger building and more people. God started challenging me for people who will be so hungry, believe for people that will be so hungry for the word of God. And will not be waiting for Jason Porter to play the first note on the guitar, will not be waiting. They're coming here waiting for God to move, pressing in already. They are ready to see God move because it will be an all word, all spirit. And I, I challenged, I felt like God said, you speak that out to release that because it's time for you, Jason, to actually receive that. It's time for you to come and agree with that. Because my heart has never changed for the making disciples. My heart has never changed for seeing people come to the knowledge of the disciples. My heart has also never changed for making 
to see people bring other people to that saving knowledge with the presence of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. Everything else is secondary when it comes to those things. Amen. So I, I, again, I thank you for your prayer. Thank you for your faithfulness and your commitment to this house. And uh, it's not, it's just not unnoticed. But I just felt like I was supposed to let you know. I still believe what God is, is, is about to do. And he's cleared out so much. He's allowed so much mess and stuff, whatever. And God has just made it clear, like, He's just bringing all, he's moving all the, uh, the fake out of the way, all this, the debris, whatever, every kingdom, like, like everything that can be shaken will be shaken. And that's worse. But we're getting to the end of that. And that which remains is going to be remaining. And that's where I believe God is about, is, is, that's the point we're at. Where now God is focused on, okay, now that I have what remains, Gideon, now the 22, from 22,000 people to 300. Now I'm ready to fight this war. Amen? Amen. Amen. Come on.